This <laughs> conference will oh. now be recorded. Thank you, Helen. Did you have the control of that? OK, brilliant. So how to deliver organisational change. For those of you who um, I don't know if any of you have joined um, a webinar that I've run before. Uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of myself, who I am. I've got a, a lot of experience in corporate learning and development roles, spent 20 odd years in large organisations. So I have personally uh, been involved in delivering organisational change. I'm a chartered psychologist and now my role is um, founder and CEO of Actus Performance Management Software. Um, and what that means is I've now had an experience working with many, many other clients as to how they try and deliver change. And it does depend there are many commonalities and it does depend from organization to organization so what I'm going to share on this webinar are learnings that we've had from all of those places if you haven't come across um, the podcast that I host it's called the HR uprising uh, we've done an episode a couple of episodes on change so that might be something which is a good resource for you and also there's other information that you might like and I'm actually really proud to tell you that I've got a book coming out on the 21st of May um, called how to be a change superhero so that goes into much of what I'm going to cover on this webinar in more detail and lots of other stuff and um, top tips is it is available for pre-order but actually there's a 99p version coming Coming out on Kindle that will be available uh, just up until the 21st of May so um, we'll let you know and keep an eye out for that there so it's a bargain to be had. So uh, in terms of what I'm going to go through during this webinar the idea is that um, first of all I'm going to under help us understand um, how we might position organisational change then we'll look at some of the causes as to why change fails and again I'm talking large large organization change fails generally. Um, we'll look at some models, the Lewin model, change model and force field analysis and then I'll go into um, Cotter in more detail because this is something that I've had a lot of success using. It's a really well known change model and I'll use that um, to walk through a case study, um, hopefully bring that to life so you can think about how you could manage organizational change yourselves. So before we do that, I just thought it would be interesting to just think about change because um, I'm conscious, I will ask you later, the sort of change you may or may not have involved, been involved in, what maybe made you interested in this as a topic. I'd like to know a little bit about that. But um, I'm wondering, you know, what sort of changes are going on for you guys since we've been, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you are in lockdown or working remotely. I mean, I have actually started getting up really early and walking the dog. I always used to think about it, but I've been doing that. Um, and I seem to have started cleaning and baking, which is a really big change. That's a personal level. Um, clearly, there's a change in terms of working remotely and doing many more Zoom meetings. Have you noticed any changes or what changes have you noticed or experienced either yourselves or in your team um, over the last three or four weeks that uh, I guess have been forced upon us? Feel free just to put them in your chat and then I'll just share a few of the notes here so everyone can have a feel of what we're thinking. I've got a new walking route. Ah, that's good. So actually a bit more exercise, but it's almost all of a sudden when you're only allowed to exercise once a day, it seems more attractive to go out and do it, doesn't it? So go and get that longer walking route. I've got some other fellow bakers and things. I've seen people doing hot cross buns and all sorts of, of amazing cooking prowess. Any other changes going on for people? Different exercise, different likelihood. What about the fact that you might now get on something like a Zoom or uh, something, even with family and friends, the whole concept, you'd never have done that. Oh my, yes, good point. So we've got uh, someone who's cooking or baking every day, school teacher while working, says Louise. Yeah, that's, that's fun, isn't it? Are you, are hopefully you're allowing yourself to have the holidays off the teaching bit, right? Here's the homeschooling. More, more walking. So, so there's been a change which has obviously been forced upon us, and that is an interesting thing in itself. So, We've all gathered different things. People are writing blogs. Well, that's great. So doing more productive um, find it, um, skills. Maybe we didn't have time to write, to writing information. So we've all been forced into a situation of change. Now, of course, during, if you think, during an organisational change, when we're actually wanting to persuade people to change, then ideally we want uh, people to choose to come with us as opposed to feel that something's been forced upon them. And that's what I wanted to find out from you here more sort of specifically. Um, what interests you about this particular topic? So I'm curious, have we got people, I've given examples here, are you someone who's in an HR or a change role and you want to 
improve your knowledge or develop your knowledge on this topic. Were you or are you in the middle of an organizational change? I mean, I know there's three or four clients that we were working with just about to drive a change and launch a change and that's gone on hold. Um, so is anyone in the middle of one at the moment over and above furloughing and um, you know, managing a whole transition of people to be home workers? Um, what is it, you know, what is it that interests you about this topic? It would just be helpful again to know I've got nearly 20 people on this um, on, on the here. So if you just tell me in the chat, what is it that interests you about this topic so I can make it as relevant as possible to you? And I'll just wait for those to come up. Let me know why you're interested in this. Okay, so someone who's got just general information, it's more of a general awareness, general level of interest. You were in the middle of a, of a change, Jane, absolutely. Okay, and that's one. Ah, someone's also looking to go into a business process change role. Okay, so great, this will be good and relevant for you in terms of the, the says a doubt, that sort of thing you can look at. Okay, great. Keep on commenting to me and I'll carry on as we go in terms of this. So the reality is change is something that uh, they've all, there's been this adage, it's almost become an, a, a myth. I think it is a, um, John Cotter is the person who originally said about 20 years ago, and he said that 70% of change initiatives fail due to people issues. Um, and what I think it means by that is the fact is that all too often change is done to us. Um, and I suppose if you think about the change with the lockdown, if, um, if, if people aren't doing it, it's to do with us choosing not to follow rules, isn't it? Or not buying into it or not believing something. Um, so that is why change initiatives fail, but it's usually due to people issues. The challenge is how can we, if we are the custodians of people, how can we help those organisations to be ready to change um, or help the people in those organisations buy into the change? And there's lots to think about there. You can read down the right hand side. The reality is, although that is something from 70, about um, 20 years ago, I think I said that, there's still, I looked at all of those stats down that right hand side, all of those have been um, said in the last three or four years. So it does see that even so, we don't have enough success when we're delivering change. And I believe there's a number of reasons that we can take from that. And that's what we're going to go through over the course of this, this webinar. Thank you for sharing, guys. So I've got people for general information. Um, Andrew's been involved in change. You deliver training around leadership and change and just reinforcing your understanding. Great stuff. OK, cool. All right. So um, in my experience, why does change system change in particular? Because that's the one that Cotter's talking about. It tends to fail. Um, I say people, 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 because people either don't communicate it effectively. People choose not to do it. They don't see what's in it for them. Um, it's all down to the human aspect. Generally, when you look at systems being implemented in organizations, the IT stuff will get there. The technical stuff will get there. The configuration will get there. But it's actually then getting people to use it. When we're bringing in a system in order to improve processes, or um, inc increase cultural, um, to come up with the cultural benefits, that only works if the people buy into it. Now, why is it that people don't always buy into it? Often that is because the change itself may not have been thought through properly. And I'll come on to that specifically when we look at the Cotter model later. It's often because the people at the top were implementing it didn't fully understand the detail or the impact of what it was they were doing. Someone at the top said, yes, we're going to implement SAP throughout our business or a new expenses system, but they didn't actually understand the intricacies and the difficulties that that would cause. So sometimes it's not being thought through properly. The other reason that changes um, can fail in Marisol, or certainly stagnate, is that there's no deadline, there's no sense of urgency, no compelling event, which means it dwindles and those people who uh, don't really want to do it uh, are able to escape because there's no deadline for them to to meet and that is similar to having a lack of clear expectations or vision because all too often we don't understand what we're trying to achieve as a result of this in terms of the expectations or, or vision here and I says if you think about it's not I don't know it's the best thing. it works if you just think about the COVID-19 the whole um, view from the government is it stay at home save lives, save the NHS. The vision is saving the NHS is what they're actually communicating. It's more powerful because there's a, a clarity of stay at home, to be very clear about what you do in order to, to save the NHS. Now, in a, a business, we would be saying, um, creating a vision around us, 
that having more streamlined processes, maybe having greater retention um, of staff because we've got a talent management process in place, having clear expectations around people setting a certain number of objectives or um, having a greater access to training. Um, training, for example, is having clear expectations of why we're doing those and what the vision is that we're trying to put in place. And again, all of these build from each other. If there isn't a lack of expectation or vision, that's very often because there isn't any powerful leadership or sponsorship. So uh, the leaders have said, OK, we're going to do this. Maybe they've subscribed to spending some money on a new system, but they're not getting involved in the messaging. Um, they're not sponsoring that change they're leaving it to other people just to do the change which may result in less buy-in or people resisting that change and then the final one for me is where a whole lot of effort goes into a change effort but it gets to a certain point and then people move on they almost move on to the next change too quickly so we don't follow it through so those would in my experience are the seven reasons why system changes in particular or trying doesn't doesn't happen properly and what we can do here is see how we can avoid that so you may or may not have come across these models as some models that you'll be aware of and those of you who train people this can be quite useful when we want to create a change Lurin was the original one who talked about unfreezing making the change and refreezing so it's almost this whole conscious piece for us to decide that we are going to change first of all we have to decide to do things differently we have to unfreeze quite literally um, and again if we think about the circumstances we're in where many people are home working i'm assuming that lots of you are home working at the moment what we were there's many people who are successfully home working that businesses would never have been prepared to try it before they, they would just say actually there's no reason for this change it can't be done then all of a sudden when we had to unfreeze by actually being told by the government that people had to work from home it was possible to do it to make that change to make that transition over now the interesting thing of course will be how will our working practices refreeze will we go back to the way we always were or will we refreeze in a new much more home working um, environment with uh, you know more social distancing no one really knows that at the moment and i guess that that is all there to see but it took um something quite significant to unfreeze now in an organization that might be something like a vision of what we need to change maybe negative consequences if we don't make that change or it could be a carrot you know something that's really going to be beneficial for us making that change but we have to identify that in order to make the change we have to stop doing what we're doing first of all and that almost means because it is a, a, a u-shape it almost feels like things get worse before they get better so and that can be when you're the change agent what's really important is realizing that we've got to unstick take as many people as possible through the unfreeze then make the change and then really key is pushing people back up the curve and that often doesn't happen that's my point about lack of impetus or follow through in large scale change that takes a while it really can be tricky to keep the energy going to push people back up into refreezing in a different and better way Now, the change equation is a way in which we can think about how we might motivate people to change. And uh, it's the thinking about, and sometimes this was, uh, some of you may have come across the burning platform concept, which is quite a depressing analogy. It goes back to the Piper Alpha disaster, where people had to choose to jump off a burning platform. Basically, the idea is that we are unlikely to change unless you create in terms of this equation, a dissatisfaction with the status quo, i.e. a burning platform, or an extremely attractive future that we see, or we think it's easy. So if you think that, that the future vision isn't all that attractive, it's going to be quite difficult, and your current dissatisfaction with the status quo isn't all that high, you're not going to be all that bothered about changing unless the um, well unless it saves you a serious amounts of money so all these factors we have to think about when we are trying to communicate why change needs to happen so and of course the dissatisfaction with the status quo may differ from person to person and sometimes we have to put in change where the people are not dissatisfied with the status quo they're perfectly happy most people would rather keep things the same so you have to create a level of dissatisfaction. We have to paint a really positive future vision. We need to help people understand that it's possible. 
um, in terms of the ease of, of making change. And we also need to be aware of if there's a really high personal or financial cost to this, how can we make that easier for people? So those are things that if you're planning your change, then you can think about how do I create a compelling event? How do I look at it overall as in terms of the curve? And then when you're thinking about the communication, because although you might think about this here, the reality is portraying this change equation, ideally you need your leaders and your sponsors helping you to explain this, explain dissatisfaction, paint a future vision and make this as easy as possible. So this all comes into how well you communicate um, the rationale for the change and the new the new way of being. Again, also, if you're thinking of doing a change in the future, you might need to think about um, what's going to stop you. So this is related to the change equation in terms of uh, driving forces and restraining forces. So if if I don't have a clear desire to change or we have, haven't got a great vision for the future, then that could be a restra restraining force. If the cost of me making that change is very high, that could also be a restraining force. Whereas on the other hand, if there is a really positive vision, I can see that it's going to be quite easy. Um, I've got other people who are wanting to do that. All of those would help push me towards the change. So it's quite useful sometimes if you're planning change, to take a step back at your organization and think about the driving and restraining forces. And those can actually be people as well. So sometimes you might want to do something like a stakeholder analysis and consider who other people who are going to drive that change? Have we got positive change agents in the organization who are going to reinforce the change? If it's something to do with people skills or management skills, do we have highly skilled managers who know what's expected, who are going to um, use this new system or manage people effectively in a certain way? Or do we have a whole load of managers who don't have the skills and they actually don't even buy into the change? The reality is, in order to, and it's quite common sense really, in order to make the change successfully, we need to work out how we can put in more driving forces than there are restraining forces. And so if it's people, if you've got negative people, it may be you've actually got to go and get them on side, um, have conversations with them about things, how can we ad you know, adapt this? And if it's uh, driving forces, then how can we add to those driving forces? How can we up the ante? How can we create a greater positive force for change? So Cotter's change model is um, the the model which for me pulls all those things together. So he has got an eight step model. Has anyone come across Cotter's change model before? So he wrote a few books, one that he talked about, um, well, a number of books on, on change. And this, this whole, uh, one of them is all about our iceberg is melting, which is more of an analogy of, of things. And one of the analogous books do with penguins, why they, whether they believed in change and the st stage of them going through the process. So what we need to do is if we want to put in place and plan a change, then here we can see across the top, we've got Lewin's unfreeze, change, refreeze um, applied to it. And he's broken these down into steps within it. So the starting point is establishing that sense of urgency. Now, this may be if we're in a business, we might identify a potential future crisis or a major opportunity. So we might look to the future um, and say, and I'm going to stick away from COVID, we've got enough COVID-19. So we'll think about something like, I can see there's a massive market opportunity if we um, can upskill people in our business in order to sell a certain style of product. Um, flip side of it is a major issue for us because an existing product that we have might go out of date or will no longer be wanted um, in the market, so we won't be profitable. So that is something, it's a sense of urgency, but it's at an organisational level, this example I'm looking at. And I think Cotter's model works particularly well for large scale change. It's perhaps a little bit too detailed for smaller changes. You might better do just things like um, the stakeholder analysis, the driving forces. Now, in terms of that, that sense of urgency, often these stages here in organisational change happens behind closed doors. The organisation isn't necessarily even aware that they need to change. 
So it might be then that, that uh, we've identified we need to change change things at an organisational level. We need a team of people who are going to help us do this. So they can form a powerful guiding coalition, which would be a group of, of people who are perhaps going to lead that change, who are going to uh, diagnose what needs to happen. If it's a system change, there might be systems experts in it. There might be communications experts in it. There may be key stakeholders from different parts of the organisation. And actually, that is a key area for us if we are the internal change experts where we can help prevent problems. One of the issues that I talked about earlier where we do have issues with change is where we haven't understood how to do things properly. And, and I've done, I've trained this model many, many times on management training courses, and we will often um, get people into teams to talk about changes they've experienced, um, where they worked and where they didn't work. And in terms of where they tend to break down, almost without exception, they break down at the point between the unfreeze and change or at the other side. And I'll talk more about that. But the area also why it often doesn't work is because of the fact that there was a lack of understanding at the top here. So although they might set a powerful guiding coalition up at the start, if they are too high level, um, and actually that was a real example I talked about earlier. I remember an expenses system which was pushed out with really demanding um, timelines but because those who were involved in the coalition at the start didn't really understand the minutiae of let's say that there were certain products that have been programmed into it reasons why it was actually not as straightforward just to switch to a different system you know within two or three weeks it had been customized very very heavily and so that caused huge problems as to why that change wasn't going to work because they tried to push too a too quick a time it wasn't thought through fully enough because the people at the top did not have the detailed understanding so what I'm saying here is you have a group large enough to lead the change, but there may also need to be some diagnosis of people where you're looking at what part of that change is going to be organized, is going to be impacted, who is it going to impact? And there may be people who need to be brought in who are experts in that certain area. So the next piece is forming or creating a vision. So we understand we need to do it, but how do we create that vision of what the change is to be? What is the future? Uh, way in which the organisation will look and also how can we start to make that sound attractive. So creating a vision that can be communicated powerfully uh, to people who will all have slightly different views about it. So in a large scale change, often those things will take place in a, I say in a darkened room um, and that is fine to a point. But what I would strongly recommend if you are somebody who's in there, make sure that these stages involve the stakeholders who will be affected. Help them take part in forming that vision. So it's not just a case that we go, ah, here, here you go, where changes fail. They go, we've decided we're going to do this. And then everybody gets an email or if you're lucky, they get uh, a communication from the CEO and people are then left to get on and do the change. So you can see where changes can fail. They say you're told to change. You're not given a frequency of communication. You're not being involved in coming up with the vision. So it, often that's where a change won't work. The, the uh, communication is change and everyone basically ignores it. So if we want to do it well, we've involved the people who are going to be affected early enough to make sure it's thought through. Um, we will then go on and communicate this vision and we communicate it in many, many ways over a period of time. Uh, so that might be many ways, including face to face, including video, including email, um, audio, whatever you like. We have lots and lots of ways in which that that communication takes place. But also we remember that communication should be two way. So we would actually give the individuals who are affected the opportunity to say how they feel. Uh, maybe even the vision gap might get refined as people are, have the opportunity to do this. So that is a really core cool part in terms of making it work. And it is natural that there will be obstacles that will start to come along and we might want to have to unblock those. And ideally, if we're not seeing them for the first time when you get here, because we did a good exploration here, then we can actually be unblocking those obstacles and empowering people to solve them. So you're starting to change the systems and structures that undermine the vision. Then this is a really key point is often we don't 
celebrate that things have changed. Creating short-term wins might be where you actually shout about the first deal. Let's say we're a business and we've restructured. So we might shout about the first deal that was won under the new brand or by a new department. That is really important because all too often there will be people, and we weren't going to on this particular webinar, but there will be people who are resisting the change who haven't actually made the change. And if they don't see anything being communicated about the change, it's easy for them to continue to ignore it. Whereas here, creating short-term whims keeps it visible. And what you're doing is you're celebrating the people who are making the change. It's a positive, And that makes it harder for the laggards not to join in, basically. And again, this is where we go, OK, many changes in my experience don't get fully consolidated because we don't push beyond this stage. We go, all oh, right, we've made a short term win. That's it. The change has happened. And we forget that it's a curve. So think back to that Lewin model and remember, you've still got to make it up the other side of the curve to make it really positive and embedded for the future. So this bit here is where we need to keep up the momentum, keep up the energy and make sure that change is consolidated. So we might have got some short term wins, but what's the next step of the change? How can we build on it? My experience is here is often, particularly with large scale change, your team that were involved from the start might be a bit tired by now. Um, they may actually also not be implementers. They might be more of, of good people to start a change. So you might want to refresh your change team to embed things and get to the point where actually this is anchored, it's fully embedded. So again, let's imagine it's a name change. So you haven't got lots of bits of old logo sitting around on old notebooks or make sure things are fully followed through, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and you can make connections between the improvement in performance and that change so people see it's there. You've put a new talent system in so you then identify that you're retaining your, your re retention rate drops so you can communicate that actually sorry increases your retention rate increases you can communicate that that's related to it you know that let's say that 80 percent of people are now using your new learning management or your new talent management system and actually you've had an uplift in performance or you know you've had a drop in attrition so make that link so people see that it's here to stay and actually your change was successful you followed it through and it's now part of how we do things around here it's business as usual so that was the explanation of it and then this is where I've layered on and we did this with a, a large client of ours and this just gives you a case study example of it so I've gone through this in great detail but all I just do is just highlight a few areas as to how we worked with this change team there and what they did so they had a sense of urgency and it was driven around they wanted to sell, sell the business. So there was a flotation on the horizon and they needed to have the right value. So it's an external business driver. They did bring along HRBPs and this was interesting because they thought they knew what they needed to do. And then they brought all of the HRBPs in from around the world and realized that there was quite a lot of change that was needed. It wasn't actually going to work in China, for example, without making sure that you could um, you know, right in a different way. Uh, so there were various snags that were spotted because they brought together this guiding coalition as opposed to just pressing through with the original group that was involved in the change. They came up with a vision and the vision was slightly different depending on what your role was in the organization. That's really relevant. Not everybody's going to buy into the business sale flotation. That's not the message for people to change. The message for the people was them feeling valued and being given the opportunity to develop. So you may need different visions and different communications for different roles in your organization. Then it was communicate in every way possible and carry on with that. They delegated ownership to geographic clusters with uh, internationally led HR training. And then they were very clear about what the outcomes were. So they put in place our performance management system and they had really smart goals. They had 90% of staff needed to have objectives in the system by the end of February 2016. So it's four years ago this. And that was within six weeks of launch. It was no mean feat and they did achieve it. And then once they'd done that, they went on to the next one, which was let's make sure that people have got development action set by three months later. So rather than it just being a one off, there was a succession of smart goals that then could be communicated as short term wins. So that was really, really effective and people could see that it was here to change. 
And once they've done that, it was actually, well, what can we do next? Let's make it more about talent management, career development, integration with other systems. And they were able to then just embed it into business as usual. So it became a core reporting function for the board who would monitor monthly the way in which people were um, being managed using this system. So that was um, a key way in which this was done. And also here, um, what I do remember quite clearly is they did move it from being their change team to be someone who was a systems expert who drove through the change. And I think that was really helpful for them to keep the momentum up. So this is my tip to you if you're going to be an HR change agent here. Right from the start, make sure that you've got the sponsorship and people understand why change needs to happen. Make sure you've got the right people. Um, think about resistors, seniority and availability and also charisma, the people who are good at actually communicating stuff. Make that vision relevant to all stuff and as exciting as possible. Do get a senior convincing sponsor involved and use a variety of approaches and styles with time for people to ask questions. We're not going to go into this here, but there are natural re reactions to change where people resist change, they might find it, um, they might deny change is happening. So it's about keeping momentum and making sure that you keep on refocusing people on what they need to do positively on the future. Celebrate those wins, don't overlook them. As people are changing, get those sponsors to shout and recognise those. And the first time round, I would say shout about the positives and those people who you know are not doing anything, have a quiet word with them. If it then seems that they're doing more or they're still not changing, then it maybe you have to get more formal or you may actually you know, express things that more, more openly. And don't stop is what I would say, bringing fresh blood. You think about people who are good at completer finishing or implementers, whereas if this is in Belbin terms, those of you who are familiar with Belbin, whereas if you're more of a resource investigator or a starter, good, good, some people are good at starting stuff, some people are good at finishing stuff. And you can see that actually it makes total sense that you'd want them at different stages in this process because it's reasonably long because it's a large scale change. And then once you finish, make sure that you've got monitoring checks for some time to make it business as usual. It's a curve. It's really easy for people to slide back down that curve. So you want to refreeze it in a new, higher, better way if you're going to get those outcomes that you're after in the first place. So almost last slide. If you want to drive change, you need to follow those models, be aware of those models, but you also need to think about your own style and attributes. You need to be prepared to both lead the change, so create a vision um, or help people to create a vision and manage it. So ensure there are consequences, follow up if people are not doing it. You may need to look at influencing people in all directions, upwards, sideways and downwards, um, you know, in order to persuade people to behave in the right way. Eff effectively, we've got to be chameleons. Help people to understand what's in it for me or why we need to change. There are lots of people who won't do, won't change unless they understand why. So just telling people to, to change is not enough. They need to be motivated. And that's where it goes to both having that change equation. There needs to be a, a dissatisfaction with the status quo and a strong vision for the future. Be passionate, be positive so much more um, having enthusiasm sound like you believe in the change is really important and also you may have to be courageous you may have to challenge people even senior people who are not getting with the program so you have to be prepared to challenge those as well but that doesn't mean it's just being bullish so again we've got to be so flexible because there will be some people who want you to listen to them so we have to be able to put on our our ability to empathize be committed, make sure you see it through to the end and be collaborative and see who you can involve. You want an army of superheroes helping you to achieve change. So work with other people, work to other people's strengths and that's the best way to get it achieved. So that's the end of um, the webinar on how to manage large scale change. I hope you found it of interest. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. I'm really happy to take questions. You can either type them or we can unmute. Uh, and also, these are the other webinars that we have got coming up over the next few weeks. So I'm doing a couple of webinars a week, if not more. So that's a link to any of the webinars that may be of use to you. 
and actually I'll put some other useful links on here. So do feel free to ask me any questions if you've got them. Here's the other, the other uh, contact details. Link in with me on LinkedIn. Check out the HR Uprising. Um, we've got a, a the podcast went live yesterday. It comes live every Monday and it was on diversity yesterday. Um, we've done lots on how to be productive, effective in these circumstances. And I said there is actually a, a podcast on this topic as well, one of the earlier ones. So I'll just give you a few moments. I know people often go shy at, shy at the end or you haven't got any questions there. Any questions coming through? Do feel free to type in. I'll be very, very happy to take them. OK, I'm going to assume that there's not. And I'm going to close down the webinar. Um, and thank you all for being involved. I hope you found it of interest and of use. Um, thanks, Louise. Yeah, and, and actually feedback would be really, really valuable because I wasn't sure whether or not this is relevant to people at the moment. Um, but hopefully all information is relevant. So uh, really, really grateful for your feedback. Uh, we'll do. OK, Tuba, no problem. I'll wait. Okay, a few people are dropping up. What's the hardest phase of the approach, says Tuba? Um, it depends on your skills, in my opinion. Uh, but I think the hardest bit is the last bit, is pushing, is, is the implementing it. But that is probably because I am not great at implementing stuff. So I, I want something, once the novelty's worn off, I think it's quite tough to kind of implement stuff, dot the I's, dot the T's. And that's why you need a change team. Um, so I think it's about bit thinking about having enough people with you to with the right natural skills to be able to implement the change fully. In terms of the it does, of course, depend also on how welcome a change is for people. So if it was a change to people's working circumstances, um, let's say it was a big redundancy program or uh, where you were having to do. Uh, yeah, a restructure then actually communicating the change can feel like the hardest part of the approach because it's difficult conversations with people where they might be having emotional reactions so that can be a hard part of the approach as well if you're having to deliver the message or deal with people's emotions that's what I would say oh what, what are the must-have skills for a change team I, I I've strongly recommend you read my book uh, on this I'll, I'll let you know too when it goes on but I have said that you need to have five traits I think there's five traits you need to be um, courageous you need to so be prepared to stand up and be counted you need to and, and that means so be able to be prepared to challenge people not just be wishy-washy you're not going to inspire people to change if you're not courageous you need to be able to communicate really effectively and flexibly and that means communicating to people with different preferences so a flexible communicator whether it's listening or persuading people being versatile in your communication uh, you need to be inspiring which means you need to be able to connect people with strategy but equally you need to be able to uh, provide evidence for the approach so come up with examples that are relevant to that audience and I believe being really collaborative as well so not being selfish being someone who's happy to be a team player as happy to follow as they are to lead so those are the five um, traits I'd say in individuals in a change team um, and then I think if you looked at something like a Belbin, Belbin profile, different skills are useful at different stages in any activity. So having people with different preferences is useful as well. So a mix of people. Have a look out for the 99p version, Tubriel. That answers, there's a chapter specifically on both those questions. Any other questions, guys? I see there's a few people still on. Oh, Del. Oh, thanks, Adele. It's um, they're a bit general, some of them, um, but they're all real. <laughs> so I'm picking into different examples. Certainly, um, it, it depends on a change, but it's always trying to apply these things to to the situation you're in. It does it does vary on the size of the change. But that Cotter model, I have trained, oh, I say, several hundred people on that and seen many examples, and it's very interesting that the change always. When, when people were sharing examples of why a change hadn't worked, I'd get them to map the eight-step process. It was almost always in that 
um, bottom bit at the intersections between refree, unfreeze and, and change and change and refreeze. Anyone, well, I will shut the presentation down in a moment, if, um, but if anyone wants to talk personally to me, just reach out on any of the contacts areas. I'm happy. I'm on, link, I'm on um, uh, social media regularly, so very happy to chat further. Thanks, guys, for the questions. <laughs>